Wisconsin Congressman Paul Ryan, he's just been named one of the 25 hardest working congressmen in Washington. And I know what you're saying. Well, that's a low bar. No, not really. <laughs> Most of these congressmen put in long hours, even if some of them are using those hours to dismantle the country. You know, if Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer worked less, I think we'd all be better off. But it's just a coincidence that Congressman Ryan has been named to this list of hardest working as we welcome him back to the show. Good morning, Congressman Ryan. Hey, good how morning, Jay. How you doing? Good to have you on again. Yeah, good to be with you. Well, let's start with fiscal matters, because when you look at the unstable markets, the frozen investors, they just sort of been frozen in time, hanging, waiting to see what's coming our way. Right. Uh, the businesses unable to get credit. There's still a credit crunch. You look at the European countries buckling under their debt loads. Is there part of you that's saying told you so this has been a long time coming we got to get our financial house in order yeah but it doesn't give you much solace uh it is kind of an i told you so moment i spent a half hour talking with ben bernanke last tuesday or wednesday and he's basically saying the the huge uncertainty that's out there uh and the uncertainty comes from two directions sovereign debt crisis and just all the other things government is doing it's basically investors worldwide Small businesses statewide don't know what government's going to do to them next, and so they're holding back. They know that taxes are going up. They just don't know how much because they keep going up. They know that new regulations are coming into place, whether it's health care, whether it's financial services, whether it's energy, and they know that all this borrowing is going to result in higher interest rates and result in higher tax rates. So it, it depresses economic activity. It makes people think less about the, the future and how, how hopeful it's going to be. And then you've got the fear of debt contagion swirling around Europe and the concern that it could wash up on our shores. Well, and that's one of the disadvantages of this global economy, and I think we all are in favor of a global economy. But yeah, apparently this morning, Moody just moved Greece into junk bond right. status. Have you right. heard that? Holy yeah, cow. And the, that, I think a lot of folks knew that was coming, but that's going to reverberate to the markets. You know, the thing is, if Greek defaults, you know, Greek in and of itself is containable. It's like 2% of the EU's GDP. But the problem is, uh, it, the fear is that's the beginning of the domino. <clears throat> and the domino then hits Spain and Portugal. Those are bigger economies. And that right there, those three countries right there, might scoop up all of the uh, bailout program that, that the EU has put together for itself. they got about a trillion-dollar bailout program where they are going out and borrowing money um, to bail out the fact that they borrowed too much money. And the problem is, is that thing could just keep going through. And that's the big fear. And what it shows you is that welfare states are unsustainable. It just shows you if there was ever a cautionary tale that should tell Americans, don't go down this path of erecting a cradle grave social welfare state. It is not sustainable and it's crashing their economies. Yeah, and you've been saying we must reform our social services programs in this country in order to stave off a budget crisis. We have to. Yeah, and, and sure enough, the overly generous welfare and social programs, that it, it's those that have Greece and these other countries in, in so much trouble. Well, and the thing is, it results in lower economic growth, less jobs, lower prosperity, less people you know, working for themselves and being independent and you know, reaching their potential. Mm -hmm. And so you, know, you don't want to have a society where the majority of people are, are takers versus makers, and unfortunately, that's what the kind of society you create, and now we're seeing that these things are just coming unglued. Yeah. And so that's really messing up the credit markets, which is affecting a lot of things, not least of which is our future economy and our growth as well. Yeah. As for the recession specifically in this country, David Obie and Nancy Pelosi have spoken of a second stimulus. Right. President Obama just called for $50 billion more to save, uh, mm -hmm. to save jobs of teachers and police officers. Are we going to need to spend more tax money to weather this recession? Well, no. I mean, obviously, I, I'm not a Keynesian, so I don't, I don't believe this stuff works. We've lost 3.6 million jobs since this sti stimulus spending bid occurred. It's already given us a $1.1 trillion debt hangover. They want to double down and go more in the same direction. Um, what this particular slug of cash they're trying to spend um, means is the federal government's going to bail out uh, big state governments, or more importantly, people from states who are frugal, who balance their budgets, who did everything right, will be bailing out uh, taxpayers in states that weren't frugal, that couldn't balance their budgets, that didn't prioritize their spending. And so what we're doing here is we're simply bailing out um, profligate spending from states. Look, everybody, you know, whether it's teachers or firefighters who, or whoever, the federal government should not be in the business of backing up all the state debt because then that becomes federal debt, and that will precipitate a debt crisis in the credit markets for ourselves. That's a very dangerous precedence. When you're saying that all this debt that's over there is now all of a sudden going to be borne by the federal taxpayer because that's what the credit markets are watching. The credit markets are watching to see if Americans are going to prevent themselves from going down the European path. 
We've got to do that or otherwise we get the European kind of economy, which is slow growth, high tax rates, high interest rates, and um, a real mess on our hands. And we don't want to have that. Yeah, and I realize that uh, the president's calling for $50 billion more to save jobs of teachers and public employees because they're his voting base. Well, and that's, yeah, I think there's a lot of political, uh, there's a lot of politics to that. Yeah, and that's but, more coalition stuff, I think, in, in many instances. Right, but I've been saying, look, if we cannot use this recession as an opportunity to realign our public employees' contracts and right. benefits packages, there then it'll never happen. That's then right. all is lost. We've got to redesign the way government works and make it more limited slimmer, leaner, and more efficient. And it, it, that's exactly right. If you, in these difficult times, don't make the necessary changes to restructure governments and their budgets, then you're, you're, you're precisely correct. And so what this is basically designed to do is to delay or prevent states from doing the necessary fiscal reforms they need to do to get their books right, mm-hmm. to get their you know, act together. One kick in the stones that's pending uh, for business owners and investors is the Bush tax cuts expiring. Right. Has there been any talk behind the scenes of, of your Republican leaders saying, no kidding, let's let's at least get these Democrat leaders to agree not to let the Bush tax cuts expire? They're no, we have. We've us, talked to Democrats about that. They're uh, rushing us into a double dip re- dip recession, that's I right. think. We've, we've said, look, let's just do two years. Let's just let's extend all of them for for two years, whatever you know, we've been doing back channels. We've been doing front channels. We've we talked about that. They really don't seem interested in doing that. Wow. They want to raise capital gains taxes. They are they want to see the dividends tax rate go up. Which, by the way, that's all investment that goes back to businesses, especially small businesses. That's where they get their seed capital. Especially if you can't get money from banks, you get it through the capital markets through people investing in you. Second point is <clears throat> the top two tax rates are tax rates that the small businesses pay. The majority of filers in those top two tax brackets are small businesses, subchapter S corporations, partnerships. That's where the jobs come from. Coming out of any recession, it's small businesses that typically do the hiring first, you know, after, before big businesses. And so the big tax increases that are scheduled to occur in January go right at the small business sector, which is what we usually depend on to get jobs back in this economy coming out of recession. And they don't seem to be interested in doing that. They're going to keep the smaller um, tax credits going, the the middle class, the child tax credit, uh, the prevention of the mayor's tax from kicking back in. Those two tax uh, cuts they're going to keep, and I think they're going to get rid of everything else. And that's basically what they're telling us in the Ways and Means Committee. Wow. Let's get to some other things, not that they don't apply to the economy as well. Uh, In fact, this does. I understand that President Obama is going to use the oil spill tonight to to push for a cap-and-tax type climate bill. Yeah, I've heard that too. That, too, absolutely wrong timing. Well, first of all, the whole goal of cap and tax, as its proponents um, claim, is to inflict this sort of uh, new regime on our energy sector to raise taxes on our energy bills, uh, which for Wisconsin uh, hits us in three ways. Because we're manufacturers, because we have cold winters, and most of our power comes from coal, it's sort of a triple tax on us in our economy. But the goal of cap and trade is to reduce warming by a fraction of one degree in 100 years. And so the whole idea about cost-benefit is thrown out the window. This is really less, in my opinion, about environment than it is about sort of ideology or economic control of a sector of our economy. And given the fact that India and China have already committed that there's no way they're doing this to their economy, what will really occur is they will get our manufacturing jobs, we'll pay higher taxes, and they'll actually produce goods that will be dirtier uh, when they produce it, and so they'll put more carbon in the atmosphere mm-hmm. at the end of the day. For every one ton of carbon we reduce, they increase theirs by about three. And so we are actually cleaner in how we produce things. The, the, our competitors do things much dirtier, but we will basically put ourselves in a competitive disadvantage with respect to manufacturing, which is where most of our jobs in Wisconsin come from. So it is a real killer for our economy. doesn't make sense from a scientific standpoint and the cost-benefit analysis just doesn't add up. And so it's really more about kind of going through the different sectors of the economy and getting government in the middle of it. We did this with health care. Uh, they're in the midst of doing it with financial services and banking. And then the next you know, sort of trifecta for this session that the president is still trying to get through is cap and trade. My big concern is even if we successfully filibuster in the Senate, the president's now telling us he's going to have the EPA do it anyway without, without any con- congressional consent. Yeah, yeah. 
they're going to get what they're what they're going to get. Uh, they're going to do what they want to do. Uh, well, I've got about three or four minutes here, and I wanted to talk about uh, the latest election as well. There, there's no doubt that the Tea Party movement is setting the agenda and the talking points in a lot of these Republican races for fall. A smaller government, lower taxes, and I assume you find that a good thing. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, the GOP drag, uh, candidates then are being dragged to the right in the primaries, but unlike other years, they really won't be able to move back toward the middle in the general election try, to try to appeal to moderate voters. Mm-hmm. So will we see Democratic candidates being able to move to the, quote, rational middle, while Republican candidates cannot? Do you I, see- don't, I don't see that happening so far. I see, uh, first of all, dragging to the right on fiscal issues. That's where the Republican Party was supposed to be to begin with. Right. So I, I don't see this as some kind of a rightward shift. I see people coming back home to what we're supposed to stand for in the Republican Party. Mm-hmm. You know, the tallest poll in the tent was fiscal conservatism. And that was the poll that we took an axe to, you know, over the last number of years near the end of the Bush administration, earmarks and things like this. So what I simply see are people coming back to our core principles, which is limited government, free enterprise, fiscal conservatism. So I, I, I by no means think that this is some kind of an extreme thing. It just simply means we're coming back to who we are. Yeah. Uh, I think Democrats are moving farther to the left. Uh, Democrats in Congress are all voting for this stuff. Whether they want to or not, they're getting their arms twisted and they're supporting it. And so I think what happens is the progressives have really sort of taken over the Democratic Party, and it really is led by the progressives who believe in this sort of end justifies the means doctrine, which is any means necessary to put in place, you know, sort of this this ideological vision of government, which is completely antithetical to the American idea. Yeah, and the reason that I think the Tea Party movement is such a positive movement, I mean, there are several reasons, but one of the reasons is whether or not they actually have candidates that they're that they're uh, pushing and getting in office, they're shifting the whole uh, conversation in yeah, right. the whole center debate. So when we do send Republicans to Washington this fall, <laughs> they will have very clear marching orders. That's what I see. I, I see this as nothing but a good thing. This, we need reinforcements up here. We've got to get rid of the hand-ringers in our own party who gave us the earmarking culture, who just you know, are unwilling to take on this entitlement problem for fear of you know, political demagoguery from the other side. We need conviction politicians here, not you know, weather vane politicians. Mm-hmm. And that means we need people who are coming here to do something to... to get something done on principle, not just to be a congressman. That's been the problem. We atrophied as a party in the, at the end of our majority. We had beers, not doers, and I see coming through Congress this next election a whole bunch of doers, and that's exactly what we